Elon Musk made history again by overcoming the challenges of the first Neuralink implant. Let's dive into the intriguing world of Neuralink, a startup owned by Elon Musk. I'll explain what Neuralink is, the first brain chip implant and its challenges, and how the Neuralink team overcame the situation to implant the second chip. Neuralink is pushing the boundaries of what's possible, implanting chips into the human brain to enable thought-controlled digital device usage. History has been made, and there's no better time to familiarize yourself with this revolutionary technology. But what is Neuralink exactly? Founded by Elon Musk in 2016, Neuralink is a neurotechnology company developing implantable brain-computer interfaces (BCIs). Their flagship product, the N1 Link, is a coin-sized device implanted in the skull, with thousands of microscopic electrodes fanning out to connect with neurons. This technology aims to decode and stimulate neural activity, essentially enabling direct communication between the brain and external devices. Neuralink's primary focus is on medical applications. The BCI holds immense potential for individuals with paralysis, Parkinson's disease, and other neurological conditions. By interpreting neural signals, the device could enable patients to control robotic limbs, restore sensory feedback, or even alleviate symptoms of neurological disorders. The journey of Neuralink hasn't been without its bumps. Indeed, even the most groundbreaking ventures face challenges and Neuralink's initial implant was no exception. The first patient to receive this revolutionary device was Noland Arbaugh, a brave individual with a spinal cord injury. In this groundbreaking experiment, Nolan became the first human to interface with Neuralink's brain chip, a device that promised him increased independence and improved control over digital devices and for the most part it delivered. Nolan reported experiencing significant improvements after the implant, showcasing the potential of this technology. However, the path to innovation is rarely smooth. Neuralink encountered a significant hurdle during this initial implant issues with electrode retraction. This was a setback, but setbacks often pave the way for greater progress. Neuralink swiftly moved to address the problem, making the necessary adjustments to restore the implant's functionality. This was a critical moment, not just for Neuralink, but for the entire field of neurotechnology. The initial implant was more than just successfully embedding a chip in a patient's brain. It was a proof of concept, demonstrating the potential of a technology that could redefine our interaction with the digital world. Despite the initial challenges, the first implant marked a significant milestone towards a new era in technology, a testament to human ingenuity and the relentless pursuit of progress. Armed with the lessons learned, Neuralink was ready for its next leap, the second implant. Learning from the past, Neuralink ventured into its second implant. The second implant marks a significant stride in Neuralink's journey, a testament to the power of human ingenuity and the relentless pursuit of progress. Neuralink's second implant was performed on a patient with a spinal cord injury. The patient, like the first, now has the ability to control digital devices with nothing more than their thoughts. This is more than a technological innovation. It's a beacon of hope for those tied down by physical limitations. The second implant was not just a replication of the first. Lessons were learned, improvements were made, and the result was a more refined, efficient process. The first implant faced a hurdle with electrode retraction. But Neuralink, true to its innovative spirit, adjusted and refined their approach. Neuralink's team explained these improvements in their latest conference. Let's watch part of that together. So we want to mitigate any of the problems that led to that situation. The brain is a fascinating organ. I'll share with you some of the secrets about the brain. During any typical brain surgery, a small amount of air is introduced into the skull. That's because neurosurgeons like to have as much room as possible around the brain. And so there's this little known control mechanism of allowing the concentration in the blood to rise a bit, which allows the brain to either expand or contract depending on where you target that CO2. But typically neurosurgeons will have the brain shrink by lowering CO2. What we're going to do in our future surgeries is keep the CO2 concentration actually quite normal, maybe even slightly elevated, and that'll allow the brain to stay its normal size and shape during surgery. That should eliminate this air pocket that we saw in the first participant. Now, that air pocket we think may have contributed to eating up some of the thread slack is as the air bubble migrated to be under the implant, push the brain away from the implant. And so that's easy enough to fix. Another consideration that we want to focus on for our upcoming participants is that the brain, think of it like a really complex folded onion. It's layer upon layer of 
sheets of neurons all over the surface of the brain folded into this odd looking shape. The folds of the brain travel down deep into the brain and, and along with it go those onion layers of neurons. And if we insert very close to one of the folds where there may be very useful information encoded in neurons, we may end up traveling with our threads parallel to some of the layers of neurons that we're most interested in, avoiding them entirely. To avoid that possibility, we're going to insert in our future participants more close to the middle of the apex of the folds, ensuring that we're crossing the layers of interest, layer five of the cortex. Another of the risk mitigations we're looking at in the future is that the implant has a certain size. The depth of the bottom of the implant is actually thinner than the average human skull. And so what we want to be able to do is control the size of the gap under the implant, give the threads that travel from the implant into the brain as much slack as possible. We didn't do this in the first participant because we didn't want to manipulate any of their tissue that we didn't absolutely have to. In upcoming implants, our plan is to sculpt the surface of the skull very intentionally to minimize the gap under the implant such that the bottom of the implant travels perfectly flush with the normal uh, contour of the inner side of the skull. That will put the implant closer to the brain. It will eliminate some of the tension on the threads. And we think it will reduce some of the tendency of threads Very to important. retract. The additional benefit here is that you do see some amount of stick up, what we call stick up, so you minor bump in the head, but this actually eliminates that even further. Yes, yeah, so really our goal is that, that if you run your hand uh, over the top of the skull, you don't feel any mm -hmm. bump, you don't feel any device. And that even if someone was bald, you wouldn't really even notice it. And and then from the inner, inner contour of the skull, that the, the brain, from a physical standpoint, doesn't really notice that there's a divot in the skull because there's no divot. Okay. Another aspect of, of the human brain that obviously differs from any of the animals that we tested in is that the human brain is a lot bigger. And so you may not realize that means the, the human brain moves quite a bit more than any of these other smaller brained creatures. And so when we open the skull... We see the brain travel toward and away from the robot about three millimeters in total as the heart beats and, and the breathing takes place. And so that movement, it, it adds a small challenge for the robot in precisely choosing a depth to insert each thread. It's not an enormous challenge, and we've already upgraded the robot's capabilities to be able to even more precisely target depth in even a very rapidly moving brain with a high amplitude of movement. You may think the most obvious mitigation for threads that pulled out of the brain is to insert them deeper. We think so too. And so we're going to broaden the range of depths at which we insert threads. For the very first participant, we had an enormous amount of data from our animal work, and we had very highly optimized our insertion depth to maximize the crossing of the layers of interest in the cortex with the electrodes that we're recording from. Now that we know retraction is a possibility, we're going to insert at a variety of depths that even in several cases of differing amounts of retracting threads, we're going to have electrodes at the proper depth and with the deepest threads be able to track how much retraction has occurred across the surface of the brain from each thread. And so we're going to both have more threads in the right layer and have better data on how much retraction has occurred. If you're a BCI nerd, you might know that being able to control individual Z depth per thread is not something that most neural interface devices offer. Most neural interface devices are a static, fixed, rigid array that you push in and all the electrodes are on depth. To be able to do this is actually pretty pretty novel part of the robot. Yeah, the historical yeah. approach is to actually pound in a sort of bed of nails with an air hammer into the brain. Well, crazy. Yeah. That, that, yeah, just add a camera. This, this is, it sounds somewhat barbaric. This is not what we do, but this is what's been done before. It's yeah. literally just hammering in what looks like a bed of nails with the brain. The second implant, as a result, saw 400 electrodes working in harmony within the patient's brain. This successful implantation is a testament to Neuralink's commitment to constant evolution. Each implant refines the process. Each success brings us one step closer to a future where physical limitations are no longer barriers to the digital world. The second patient's experience is already showing the benefits of these improvements. The increased efficiency in thought-controlled device interaction is a clear indicator of Neuralink's progress. The patient's independence has been enhanced, and their control over devices improved. The second implant is not just a sequel, it's an evolution. It's a proof of concept that we can learn, adapt, and improve. It's a promise of a future where we are not just users of technology, but an integral part of it. With each success, Neuralink is inching closer to transforming how we interact with the digital world. So what's next for Neuralink?
Well, with two successful implants in patients, Neuralink is far from slowing down. In fact, Elon Musk has grand plans for the future of this revolutionary technology. He set an ambitious goal to implant the device in eight more patients by the end of the year. That's right, from two to ten in just a few months. It's a testament to the pace at which Neuralink and its team are pushing boundaries. Neuralink holds the potential to augment human capacities to bridge the gap between our brains and the digital world. In the future, we could see a seamless integration with technology, redefining how we interact with our devices, how we communicate, learn, and even how we entertain ourselves. Of course, all this comes with its own set of challenges. The road to widespread adoption of Neuralink isn't without hurdles. There are regulatory considerations, potential health risks, and ethical implications to consider, but with every successful implant, with every problem solved, we move one step closer to that future.